Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Dr. Lee Richards on why is my mud bill so high? How to minimize costs associated with a healthy OBM system. Uh, before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of the audience. So I'm going to launch some polling questions. And uh, the first question is, what is your primary discipline? So the polls are open now. So if you see the question, it looks like we have quite a few in the petroleum engineering discipline, several in geoscience, and a few in other. Uh, we're still getting responses in. Looks like about half of you have voted so far. Quite a few in the other camp, but um, over 50% in petroleum engineering and some in geoscience as well. So we're still getting responses. Go ahead and list your discipline. I'll give you a few minutes to find that. About three quarters of you have voted and half of you, over half, are in petroleum engineering as your chosen discipline. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and close that first poll and share the results. And it looks like 56% are in petroleum engineering, 11% geoscience, and 33% other. So thanks for that. So now we have a second poll. I'll launch this. How many years of full-time experience do you have in the oil and gas industry? Looks like we've got a wide range from less than one year all the way to over 30 years. So this must be an easier question. We're getting quicker responses. Quite a few of you over 30 years and another big group in the 21 to 30 year group. So we have about three quarters of you who have voted, so I'll go ahead and close that poll and share the results. Looks like our um, one to 10 year group has 29% and over 30 years has 29%. So two big groups, kind of a dimodal distribution. So I'm gonna hide that. And um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Richards, I'd like to remind you that uh, during today's webinar, generally we mute our audience. And uh, typically we would ask you to use the GoToWebinar question feature to type in your questions. And often we wait to the end of the presentation to cover the questions. And in that case, if I read your question, you will be anonymous. But if in this case, you would like to ask your question during the webinar and you would like to say it yourself, uh, please use the raise hand feature and I will interrupt Dr. Lee. I will need to unmute you. So that's why you'll need to raise your hand uh, to be able to do that. Uh, but we'll be able to interrupt him and ask Dr. Richards your questions. And in that case, you will not be anonymous because we'll know who you are. So you have a choice. If you want to ask those silly questions like, uh, what does OBM stand for? Then you might want to use the chat feature. So I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop and make sure I'm covering the introductory slides here. And make sure I'm sharing. Okay, let me try this again. There we go. Okay, so I will start out with some introductory slides. And uh, this is SCA's webinar today on why is my med bill so high? How to minimize the cost associated with a healthy OBM system. And so our speaker today is Dr. Lee Richards. Emma. 
Okay, I'm going to have to take it out of show mode. See if I can. Sorry, I'm having a delay. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Richards is a petroleum engineer who's worked for Halliburton and BP America during his career. Currently, he's an assistant professor of petroleum engineering at Montana Tech in Butte, and he's also a consultant for several clients. He's authored a variety of publications, and he often gives presentations. So we look forward to hearing from him today. He has his BS in chemical engineering from Washington State and his PhD from Montana State University. Uh, for SCA, Dr. Richards teaches these courses, Drilling Fluids, Introduction to Drilling Engineering, and Well Control for Drilling Engineers and Senior Rig Personnel. So in August, uh, Dr. Richards will be teaching his course on drilling fluids in a live online format. So we've started to introduce this type of format during the COVID-19 lockdown. And it's also quite helpful if your company is restricting travel. So uh, this course will be taught uh, during the dates of August 17th through 19th in four hour segments. So morning time from eight to noon Houston time. And you can see the outline of the course content. So if you're interested in registering for this course, you can contact uh, SCA at the contact listed there, um, email or phone number. And be sure and ask for the live online version of Dr. Richard's class. And of course, SCA, in addition to training, we also do consulting, direct hire services, and we conduct projects and studies. And so now I'm going to give the presentation rights to Dr. Richards. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am uh, Dr. Lee Richards. I usually just go by Lee. Um, and I am going to give you a couple of tips here on running some oil-based mud, hopefully save you some money. Um, I see that there are a pile of uh, uh, experienced hands out there. So some of this will be, you'll, you'll know a lot of this. Um, hopefully I can give you some unique insight into it. Um, some of the uh, less senior hands, maybe that a lot of this will be new. Um, but for everybody, I hope there is um, some insight to be gained here. Um, so, why is my mud bill so high? That's the name of my presentation. We're gonna look at a few things you can do to minimize costs um, associated with running a healthy OBM system. That's, that's the key, right? You can run a cheap OBM system that's right on the edge of failure, or you can run a healthy OBM system um, and try to minimize your costs. So a little bit about my background, because I think it's important. Um, I come from a, what I think is a fairly unique place. So I, I, I grew up um, before I went to school, working my way through school. I, I worked in construction, just a blue collar guy, pounded nails, I loved it, I was outside. Um, everybody, all my family, that's what they did. Um, just that that's kind of where I came from. So went to school, got a PhD. Um, I was wandering around the career fair one day and uh, Hal Burton was there and I stopped and I said, hey, do you uh, hire chemical engineers? And they said, oh man, sure, we sure do. So uh, they said, we'll give you a four wheel drive pickup. Um, you'll see interesting lo in remote locations. You'll see the, the sun come up every day and you'll see it go down every day. Um, so I thought, man, sign me up. So I didn't really know what I was getting into. I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have any oil field background. Um, so, you know, I was, uh, I was a new engineer, just, just out, excited to see what was going on. So, you know, I, I, I dove into being a mud engineer for uh, seven years, and then I moved on to company man for another three years. And then I got the opportunity to be a college professor, and I took it um, kind of coming back. One of the main reasons I did that was my time in the field 
um, I saw a big disconnect quite frequently between the engineers in the office and the personnel in the field. And uh, I was hoping that I could do something to bridge that gap because I think it's fairly unique that a field guy is able to come back and be a college professor. Um, I don't know from so far, I, I'm the only PhD mud engineer that I ever met. So um, anyway, that's a little bit about me. This picture here in the lower right um, is a picture of a younger me in North Dakota. Um, if you'll notice that storm behind me, it's got a little bit of rotation to it. Um, there were tornadoes all around us that day. And it was, it was kind of an interesting experience. You know, you just sort of, uh, it may hit our rig, it may not. There's nothing we can do, just keep working. So anyway, I thought that was an interesting picture. I thought I'd share it, so. Okay, um, I'm gonna cover a few things here. Now, I will not have time to cover everything that you need to know about oil-based mud. Um, and that, that could take weeks, but um, in, my, in my normal classes, I'll spend a lot more time going in depth into these things, but there's a couple of highlights I'm gonna to try to hit here today that I think will give you some insight into how to save some money when running your systems. Um, so we're gonna look at downhole losses. This one's a big one. Um, as we all know, as soon as we start taking losses with OBM, um, the mud bill just starts shooting through the roof. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. There, sometimes there's not a lot you can do. Then the big reason why we do not minimize our costs with oil-based mud is quite frequently because we don't understand what's going on in an invert emulsion system. So I'm gonna talk about that. I'm gonna give you a little bit of insight into how an invert emulsion system works. And we're gonna talk about water influxes. Um, I should have on here, we'll also talk about solids because there's really only two contaminants you have to deal with with an OBM system. Um, one is water, one is solids. Without those two things are the only things that can mess up an OBM system. Other than this last thing I have listed, and laziness is a giant problem. And um, I apologize ahead of time if there's any mud engineers out there, um, but I'm going to let out a few secrets here from spending a good deal of my adult life as a mud engineer around mud engineers. So um, I think there's a few things people need to know. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about downhole losses. These are mechanical. So we don't really need that. Um, Lee, I think we have a question. Okay, go from, ahead. From Ian Scott. Ian? What? I can't unmute Ian. Maybe he needs to unmute himself too. No, uh, they don't have that option, but. There should be a microphone button. Unmute all. No. Yeah, there's an unmute. Will you unmute us all? Yeah, I just unmuted everybody. So Ian, can you can you speak? No? Okay. He doesn't have a mute button. I don't know why. Ian, please hey, take your mute. Ian. Ian, can you hear us? All right, I'm going to put everybody back on mute. Ian, if you, if you can hear me, please uh, um, put your question in the chat bar and we will ask uh, um, Dr. Uh, Richards. Okay, go ahead and continue on. Uh -oh, did I accidentally mute you too? So sorry. All right. It's a new format. All in mute. There we go. Okay. There you are. There you are. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, thank you everybody for bearing with us on this. As I think everybody knows that um, adapting to our new way of life and our new way of doing business has a few quirks here and there. So uh, um, bear with us. This will get better. So um, on the question side, please do not hesitate to ask questions as I go along. Um, I've designed the presentation that um, it's, it really needs interaction. 
Um, my experience is that if one person has a question, another person probably has the same question. And what's for sure is if one person has a question, usually almost everybody's gonna learn from that question. Um, the audience is almost always better at knowing what they need to know than the presenter. So don't hesitate one bit to, uh, to, to stop me and ask a question. Um, and we'll get these bucks worked out. So, okay, um, back to downhole losses. So we, we're gonna, well, I'm gonna cover these right now up front and um, then we're gonna move on to a little bit more of the technical side. The downhill losses are, downhill losses are entirely mechanical, so we just cover those straight up. Um, few things to talk about. Now the first one, and this is obvious to everybody, is well planning. Um, if you know there's a potential for severe losses, uh, you, you need to plan around it. Um, if, if, you're going, if you know you're gonna be dumping OBM down the hole, um, just don't do it. Either switch to water-based mud, if at all practical, and I can tell you that it usually is, um, or alter your casing points. Um, there are good water-based systems out there that will control shales. In, in my experience, they do not control shales as good as an OBM system, but you may be able to use them to get through an interval. Now that said, some of these are as expensive as an OBM system, so you have to weigh those costs. Um, but it's really important to look at your well planning if you know severe losses are coming. Um, so barring that, um, the first thing you can do and the best thing you can do is have a fast response with LCM um, and get your ECDs down. That's the key that most people don't realize is that a lot of these losses can be mitigated simply by lowering your ECDs. Um, so if you um, start taking moderate to severe losses, meaning you're not getting returns to surface. If you're not getting returns to surface and there's any chance whatsoever of a well control situation, you need to pick up off bottom and get your ECDs down. So pick up off bottom, lower your pump rates. Um, if you're having moderate losses, meaning you are getting returns to the surface, um, maybe you can keep drilling, but you may have to slow down. And I know we hate slowing down. That's not the right thing to say. Um, and as, as working and drilling my whole life, you know, you never want to slow down, but sometimes slowing down can save you some money. Um, because if you're going to be losing um, 100 barrels of OBM an hour, um, is, it, is it cheaper to lose that, that mud um, than to slow your drilling rates down from 50 feet an hour to 10 feet an hour, um, just for the time being until you can get things healed up. So you have to weigh those, those odds, but it was really important to remember that your ECDs usually play a huge role in these losses. So um, first thing you can do, slow down, um, reduce your pump rates. While you're mixing up your LCM, um, this is often a very good path to take to minimize losses before you can get some LCM down hole. Um, when you are mixing LCM, it is generally best practice in my experience unless you're really first with this loss and you know there's a specific size LCM, size and shape I should say, of LCM that has combated it in the past, um, it's good to kind of throw the kitchen sink at it. Um, so I like to use large and small diameter LCM. Um, I like to use all the types I have available. So that would be flake, um, spherical, and angular um, products. So, uh, and also fibrous products. So um, angular and flake products can be considered the same. I, I consider them somewhat different, but uh, basically what LCM you have on site, um, uh, uh, kind of a witch's brew is generally best when you, to get these losses stopped right away. First response, send down maximum LCM concentrations in a slug or pill. Um, I often want to soak these. If, like I said, if my losses are severe and I'm not getting returns to the surface, um, if you can spot this in the zone, it quite frequently will cause um, the LCM to more of the LCM to move into the formation. The big problem with LCM is you're going to pump most of it out of the hole most of the time. So um, if you can if you can soak these, if you have that luxury where you're not going to get stuck, um, it is a 
it's a very good option. Now that mentioned, I mean, if if you have had problems with differential sticking in the past, this is the time when you are going to get differentially stuck like no other. So um, you have to play this. This this takes some caution, right? Um, an, another note here is that. Swellable products generally don't work with OBM, which is unfortunate. There are some polymers that do work with OBM and your mud company may have something, but as a whole, um, we can stop up some pretty big leaks with water-based mud with some great products that are out there. Um, but with OBM, it's a little more difficult. So that it kind of takes that tool away. Um, anytime we are talking about pumping LCM, of course, we are going to have um, complaints from our MWD. And in my experience, the MWD is almost always overcautious. Um, I think it's very important to know the tool that you're running and actually look up the specs yourself. Because when I've done this, in my experience, I'll look up the specs of the, the quantities that the tool of, of LCM that the tool can take and it's way higher than the MWD hand will let me pump through it. So generally you can have a discussion there and you can get a little more LCM through that MWD than your hand is usually saying. That said, I would never recommend exceeding the concentrations that your the MWD tool is actually spec for, but again, quite frequently the tool spec for higher concentrations than you would expect. Um, the key to mitigating these losses and, and keeping your, your mud bill down, uh, I mean, again, that's, this is when mud bill skyrockets, when you start pumping LCM into the, or, uh, or OBM into the formations is. The key is a swift response, um, both with ECDs and with LCM. So um, being ready to pump these things is a, is a big help. And if you know that there's a possibility of these things coming. What I like to do as a mud hand is I would have maybe a pallet set aside next to my mixing house. So when we do start taking losses, I've got everything I need to build a pill right there, an LCM pill. I've got the number of sacks I want stacked up and they're all right there. All they gotta do is cut the sacks and build the pill super quick. Um, that'll save you money and it's, it's nothing to just have a pallet sitting there. That's 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 one little dirty trick I can give you there. Um, and and then you, Wait, you're... we've got a we've, we've yeah, got go a ahead. question. So first question: What if we're not allowed to use lost circulation material (LCM) uh, such as in a reservoir zone? Okay. Um, if you cannot use any LCM, um, you I mean obviously your hands are tied a little bit. Uh, if, Again, there comes back to well planning. If, if, if you know you're not gonna be able to use LCM in the zone, um, you better, it may be better to run a water-based mud. Um, that said, you can't always do that. So then, then it comes down to ECDs. The only thing you can fight this with, if you don't have LCM available to you is ECDs. You just gotta lower your ECDs and whatever that takes. Um, that said, you can quite frequently um, there are LCMs like size calcium carbonate, generally in a reservoir, um, you can pump that and an acid job will clean that up pretty good. So um, that may be an option for you. You know, there's, there's, it's, uh, it's hard to say. Um, hopefully that answered that question. Okay, we have one more question from the audience. Good. Any comments on leveraging mud loss events slash data to infer reservoir information such as caves, cars, etc okay um that is an excellent question and i am not the person to answer it uh i don't i don't have the experience to give you a really good uh good answer there i'll tell you when you're taking losses you've got more porosity and permeability that's about all i can tell you um so yeah good question but uh, i i apologize that i don't have the uh don't have much insight there and more comment from the audience if there's severe losses loss issues like cars use MPD. Uh, can you say that again, Susan? Yes, they said it's severe loss issues like cart use MPD. I think perhaps cart was cars. Yeah, 
Okay. Okay. Good comment. Excellent. Keep them coming. All right. Okay. So um, moving forward here, we'll start talking about some seepage losses. These are obviously easier mm -hmm. to handle, but more widespread. Um, again, the first thing this comes down to, um, broken record here, I know, but it's just, I like to keep it on everybody's mind, is well planning. Um, if you can plan casing strings around this, great. Um, if you can, if you can't, then you're keeping those ECDs down by planning is your best um, way to combat this. So meaning you might not need five and a half inch drill pipe. You might be able to get away with five inch. Um, you might not need six inch drill collars. You might be able to get away with five and a half. And the reductions in ECDs um, will be drastic. Um, again, if you are experiencing seepage losses, reducing pumping and drilling rates is in the first way to combat it. You can almost always stop them by lowering the ECDs. Um, and, and I said almost always, but um, in it quite frequently, I should say. Okay, but barring that, we, we want to drill as fast as we can. Uh, that's always been my mantra. So when we know we're going to have this coming or, or it comes around unexpectedly, running some background LCM is quite frequently um, one of the best ways to, to combat this. So um, if you look at what you want to do is run some LCM that will go through your shakers, okay? So um, now you can always run LCM that won't go through your shakers, and that's a great way to stop your seepage losses, but you'll be losing your LCM over your shakers. Not only will you be losing LCM over your shakers, you will be losing um, mud on that LCM, right? So um, it's not a drastic amount that you're getting, that you're losing, you know, it's mud lost to cuttings basically at that point, but um, it is additional mud that is lost. So one of the best ways when you're having minor, minor to, to moderate seepage losses is some background LCM um, that will pass through your shakers. Now, my favorite product for this is size graphite. There's, there's plenty of other products out there, but this is a product that'll stay in your system. Um, it has very low impact on your, um, your equipment and it is highly effective against seepage losses in that um, size graphite tends to stick to itself. So when you pump it down hole, some of it will go into the formation and other particles will stick to it on top of that. And quite frequently, um, you can have great success with that. This, this product costs a little bit more than other LCMs, but again, you get to keep it quite frequently if you plan correctly meaning you've got your graphite size that most of it's going to go through your screens and you're going to be able to keep it in your system. Um, now, I, I, I want to make one comment here and I'll talk about it a little bit more when we talk about solids here, but all this stuff, of course, is going to raise your low gravity solids content, which will lead to um, advanced rates of uh, failures for your pumps and equipment. Now we can try to minimize that. Again, size graphite's not too bad, but it is an abrasive. So, I mean, all that is the caveat with using any of these products. So um, everything's a trade-off, right? Okay. So now going forward, in okay, order we've got a couple more comments from the audience. Great. So, uh, MPD measured managed pressure drilling is a well-known remedy for managing ECDs, equivalent circulating densities, uh, particularly with karst. Pressurized mud cap is used for karst in Asia. And then another comment, it's still better to use LCM pills, uh, lost circulation material pills. Yeah, yeah, okay, both of those comments are great. Um, MPD, absolutely, if, if you can, um, if you have the, uh, the, the luxury of running an MPD system, um, that is without a doubt the way to go. Um, and, and quite frequently, it's expensive to run them up front. But if you are going to take a pile of losses, um, it, may, it may pencil out that running MPD actually works out better for you. Um, absolutely, absolutely. And then um, LCM pills are, are, are the way to go. Uh, if, if, if you can run an LCM pill to stop, if, and that will stop all of your losses, then by all means do that. 
But if you keep drilling through formations that are going to keep exposing new loss zones, um, that background LCM can help quite a lot, quite a lot. But LCM pills, absolutely, that that is the solution to um, most losses. But these seepage losses quite frequently can be handled um, with background. Okay, so moving forward, um, we're just going to, most of you guys will know um, what's going on in an invert system, but in order to fight the, our two main contaminants, solids and um, and water, we just we really need to have a fundamental understanding of what's going on in our invert emulsion system. Um, this will be pretty basic. Um, I cover it much more in depth um, in in longer classes, but right now I'm just going to give everybody a quick introduction. So what we have, why it's an invert emulsion? A regular emulsion is um, oil suspended in water. Uh, an example of that would be something like mayonnaise. Um, this is water suspended in oil, okay? So these water droplets are suspended in the oil. And as we all know, oil floats on water. You take a salad dressing, you mix it up. Um, oil flows to the top, water sinks to the bottom. Well, the same thing would happen in our mud system. But what we do is we get these water droplets so small that the surface area interactions of the water droplet um, well, there's a water droplet complex, which I'll explain going forward. The surface area interactions actually keep this water droplet suspended. So um, I'll explain that a little bit more going forward. So it, we have to keep these water droplets small. That is the nature of emulsion stability. We've all heard emulsion stability when we're talking about OBM. So um, I'll explain that a little bit. The other key factor is we have to keep the bayrite suspended in the oil phase. If water gets near our bayrite, um, we're done. Um, once that bayrite gets water wet, it is very difficult, next to impossible, um, to get it back to oil wet. Um, so we have to keep the bayrite oil wet and not water wet. So to understand that, um, we got to understand emulsifiers a little bit going forward. Now, this is a really simple representation here. Um, if you look here, the arrow end represents a polar end. Okay, so this, this is a, a long chain molecule, and the, the straight line end that I have here represents a nonpolar end. The nonpolar end, of course, will be attracted to oil, and the polar end will be attracted to water. Um, one thing to note about these emulsifiers is that the, in order to activate these emulsifiers, we need lime in the system. This is an important part of figuring out how we're gonna save some money in our OBM system. So um, you, these are activated by lime. Um, another thing to remember is that they're expensive. So we don't wanna just pour them in there willy nilly. So we have to use our emulsifiers wisely. So um, I'll talk about that a little bit going forward here. And first off, we need to understand what a micelle is. And when I talked about the water droplet complex, that's what I was talking about. I was talking about a micelle. And these are colloidal components of your OBM system. Um, colloidal means that they are less than two microns in, in diameter. They will, it also implies that they will suspend. Okay, again, they're very small. They've got a large surface area per mass. They'll stay suspended in our system. Um, basically what this is, is an emulsifier surrounding a water droplet. Um, and this will keep, if we have these emulsifiers surrounding the water droplet, it'll keep them small and that will help us keep them suspended. That, that is the key to running these systems is understanding this, this micelle interaction. Um, one interesting thing about this, and we'll touch on it at the end if we have time, is that these micelles, the emulsifiers surrounding the water, and I have a picture of that coming up or a diagram, um, this allows water to pass through somewhat like a semi-permeable membrane, but it does not allow chlorides to transport to through there. So um, this, this is an important thing to remember. It will, it will not allow chloride transport to the formation. So this will be a little more obvious looking at this slide I have here. So this is a simplified representation of what a micelle would look like. Um, in the center, you see a water droplet surrounded by uh, emulsifiers. Basically, on the outside in the white would be oil, and the inside, the blue, is water, 
and the polar ends of the emulsifiers are attracted to the water and the non-polar ends are attracted to the oil. Um, of course, this would be in 3D, it would be a sphere. Um, and of course, in our system, this would be a brine almost always. Um, but in order for simplification, just for understanding, I have it represented as water in this presentation. But just so everybody knows, most of the time we would have a brine in here. And we'll talk about that a little bit going forward. But the brine isn't super important for our emulsion stability. Okay, here's what a healthy invert system should look like in a, in a simplified um, way. Basically, what we have here are these micelles, um, small little water droplets surrounded by emulsifiers. Um, those are suspended. And again, they're being held up by surface area interactions because they are so small. In this oil-based system, you will also see um, some simplified bayrite, bayrite molecules here floating around. These wouldn't be molecules. These would actually be bayrite particles, excuse me. Um, but these would be very fine bayrite particles. And we would be suspending them with the viscous forces that were created by these micelles in the oil-based mud. Um, it's important to note that oil is the continuous phase here, meaning I can draw a line through the oil and never touch water. I cannot draw a line through all the water and never touch oil. Um, that's what continuous phase means, is that you can, it, it, the continuous phase is always touching itself, the discontinuous phase or non-continuous phase, which is the water or brine, <clears throat> is not touching the other water and brine. That's a very important part about keeping our systems healthy here. So, <clears throat> so let's talk about a couple of problems that we can encounter. Now, again, I said that there are really two main contaminants, um, one being water, one being solid. So we'll talk about battling the water up front here. Um, first off, what are the problems with water influx? Well, first off, first thing you notice is it builds viscosity. <clears throat> Excuse me. You will see, um, you'll see your funnel vis start to build, maybe, but you will see your, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you, your low, um, your low RPM uh, fan viscometer starting to, um, starting starting to raise <clears throat> oh i'm very sorry okay um i've got a little something in my throat here <clears throat> okay so you'll also start to see low emotion motion stability um via your es meter um, when you start getting water in here okay these are the indicators that most people are used to um having free water in your system is the real indicator that tells me that I have a problem. And I'll talk about that going forward. I'm talking about looking at free water in your HTHP. And that free water then will lead to water wet bayrite. And this is what is going to flip your mud system. This is the biggest hazard you have to deal with when dealing with an OBM system is that if your bayrite gets wet, you can't get it back. So let's talk about that going forward here. So this is what a unhealthy OBM system would look like. <clears throat> if you look here, what we have are, you'll have some free water molecules out here just floating around in the oil. Well, eventually those are gonna settle out and or <clears throat> they will come into contact with a Bayrite particle. Um, so what I have represented here are some, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm very sorry, but I have to get a drink of water. I'll be right back. Um, look at this slide for a second. I'll be back in just a second. I so apologize. Hold on. So while Lee is getting a drink of water, be sure and post your questions you have in the question box. And uh, just thinking ahead after uh, today's webinar is over, you'll receive a link to a recording of the webinar. You'll get an evaluation form, a link to register for his class. It's an online virtual class scheduled August 17th through 19th. Those are half days, uh, morning time in Houston from 8 a.m. to noon. So four-hour segments in three half days. 
So it looks like we're having some questions come in now. We'll wait till he gets back. Oh, I'm back. Okay, here's a question. Do you consider formation hydrocarbon oil as a contaminant? Ah, great question. Um, first off, let me apologize for having to run out. I, I put this water to have it next to me and I forgot to bring it, so I apologize. <clears throat> um, formation hydrocarbons, yes, they are a contaminant typically, but we can usually handle that. Um, generally, uh, if we start taking oil and or um, gas, gas will be entrained until it gets to surface. And then we can get it out with our gas buster or our surface equipment. <clears throat> but the, the oil, we can actually use to build mud if we have to, if it will incorporate. A lot of times it's gonna come out on your shakers. It all depends on the oil that you're getting. Um, in North Dakota, when I was working there, quite frequently we would take oil, and it, it would it would actually work into our emulsion. Um, so it's not ideal, obviously, to be taking oil. I mean, you could say, "Oh, that's great, we're going to build base fluid, right?" Well, I'll reiterate that if you're taking oil, um, you 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 have a slight well control problem as well. So um, you're kind of on the edge of ed edge of things there. So you you it you're kind of playing a well control game there too. So generally, uh, yes, they are a contaminant. Uh, I treat them more as a well control situation than as a contaminant that'll mess up my mud. For the most part, even oil-based mud is very, very resilient. It's resilient to, obviously, to, to, um, to, to natural gas and um, oil influxes, but it's also resilient to acid gas influxes you just need to make sure you manage those at the surface. Um, so, um, very good question. And you had a follow-up. I think you briefly mentioned formation gas, but how would you handle that? Is that a contaminant? Yeah, okay, so um, handling, my, my experience handling formation gas in the field is simply a well control situation. If you can, um, a lot of times if, it, if the background's low enough, you don't have to worry about it. Oh, quite a times you can vent it to your gas buster. Maybe all it takes is just running it through your gas buster. Um, that may not even be necessary if it's just slight background gas. Um, you know, that, that, that again comes down to a well control issue, in my opinion. Generally, you don't have to alter okay, your mud. One, one more question. What are your thoughts on Bayright recovery systems? Are they worth it? And it looks like it's from a Montana Tech Diggers fan. Go Diggers. Go, go Diggs. Um, all right, I am going to handle that question going forward. Uh, I have some slides on that, but I'll tell you right now, you probably shouldn't run Bayright Recovery. Um, I, that'll be controversial, and I'm welcome to discuss to discuss it, but uh, um, yeah, it probably doesn't really work. So, um, well, I'll, I'll get there. Great question. Really, really good questions. Any, any other, Susan? That's it for now. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, once again, I apologize for dashing out. I meant to have water ready and I, I just left it outside. I had my dogs guarding it for me. So um, it was safe where I found it. Okay, so reiterating again here, this is what, these are the problems associated with um, oil-based mud and free water in our oil-based mud. Um, these water droplets will agglomerate. As you'll see, some of these micelles have gotten big, where I represented by three water droplets. Those are gonna end up getting too big and they will fall out of the system. <clears throat> Along with those falling out of the system, you'll see here where I've got water that can come into contact with Bayrite directly. As soon as that happens, that Bayrite will fall out of the system. Then in addition, yeah, I've got where these micelles are losing their uh, their emulsifiers and the bayrites coming into contact with the water um, and that will fall out of our system. So these are the pitfalls we need to keep in mind going forward. Okay, so these weak emulsions, as I said, you've got a large agglomeration of water that will fall out. Water wet bayrite, that will fall out. Okay, these are the things we have to fight against. So the solution, again, Plan your well right. If you're trying to fight significant water influxes, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. If you know you're gonna be taking something in the order of 50 barrels of water a day um, and or more, 
you're you can fight it but it's going to cost you money i mean there's not much way around it other than pouring emulsifiers in your system um and building mud hopefully you have the room room to build that mud because if you're taking 50 barrels of water a day at a 70 30 oil water ratio you can do the math on how much mud you're going to be building um <clears throat> the worst thing you want is to build a whole bunch of mud that you have to ship out during your well um, and that mud being low quality mud so um so one of the things you, you need strong emulsions to fight this if you have a good strong emulsion you can take a goodly bit of water um, and it won't cost you too much. One of the one of the tricks here is using oil wetting agents. If you are taking water, it's essential to use an oil wetting agent um, when you're mixing bayrite. So another thing you can do is if you are expecting a water influx, you can plan ahead for it by elevating your oil water ratio. So maybe your ideal oil, oil water ratio is 70-30, you may bump it up to 80 20 knowing you've got some water coming so you plan ahead and use the water to build mud as long as you have the room for it um, and again but it's essential to make sure you have a healthy system now this one here is really important if you run excess lime of two barrel two pounds a barrel or more um, and i most people say one pound a barrel or more but i say two simply because lime is cheap um, and for the most part you, there's not much of a pitfall for running more lime. If you run excess lime, this ensures that your emulsifiers are gonna work when you do take the water. So remember I said these emulsifiers were activated by water, or I mean by lime. Um, so you just make sure that you're running excess lime concentrations high enough to activate these emulsifiers. Okay, so this okay, last- Okay, we have another question. Great. One more question. Um, are there any good methods for comparing different emulsifiers or the quality of good slash bad emulsion? Okay, the quality of a good slash bad emulsion, I can I will get to. Um, and absolutely, there is a cut and dry way to measure that in the field that most of your mud engineers may not be doing. Um, but to measure the emulsifiers, good and bad, um, I can't answer to that. You know. Um, a red mud company will tell you that their emulsifiers are better than a blue mud company and the blue mud company will tell you that their emulsifiers are better than the red company um, to be honest they're probably made out of the same stuff um, i've used them all they all work so um, that's my answer for that one okay this last one um, again mud engineers i apologize and this does not apply to you if you're uh attending this web webinar because uh, the, you're, you're obviously being diligent about your job. But the fact of the matter is there are a lot of mud engineers out there that are pretty lazy. They can be a slothful lot. Um, there is, a, like I said in this slide, there's plenty of time to watch Tiger King uh, after a good mud check is done. Um, I'll just share a quick story. When I was training, I rode with a fellow that did not do a mud check for two weeks. It was brutal. Those people are out there. You need to know they're out there. And I'm, I'm saying this just because it gives us all a bad name. Um, you need to look out for them. And this is the main reason why I think an average mud bill gets too high. It's just people don't pay attention to it. So the first thing here is to make sure that your mud engineer is doing a complete mud check. Sure. I'm sure anybody worth their salts doing a mud weight funnel this and they're running their ES meter. Um, they're probably doing alkalinity and water phase salinity. These are all great, but what you really need to ensure that you have a healthy system is somebody running a 50 mil retort and an HTHP. I don't know how many mud labs I've walked into where there was dust on the 50 mil and the HTHP, or they didn't even have a 50 mil. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about solids here when I talk about these retorts, but a 10 mil retort is completely inadequate if you are at all concerned about the solids content in your mud. Um, you need to be running a 50 mil retort to get the most accuracy out, out of your measurements. 
Um, if you really want an accurate low gravity solids measurement, um, a 20 mil, mil retort is adequate, but a 50 mil is better. Um, the, the errors are just so high with a 10 mil retort. It, if you're looking at, if, let's just say you want 5% max low gravity solids. Well, if the error of your instrument, i.e. a 10 mil retort is plus or minus 4%, you really don't have any clue what you have in there. Um, there you need a 50 mil retort. You, if your MUN engineer doesn't have one, he should be able to get one. Um, if he can't get one, his MUD company should be able to get one. If they're running oil-based MUD, this is a small cost for your business. Um, another part of this is that it needs to be calibrated. I've used dozens of these things. I've calibrated them all, and they don't all produce 50 mils when calibrated with diesel fuel. So um, you could, the best way to do this, fill it up, run a JP tube or a Drager tube, uh, an accurate measuring device, and see if you get 50 mils out. If you don't, you need to correct for that to get accurate high gravity and low gravity solids concentration. So here's a little trick. Um, you really should have your mud engineer make sure he's running a 50 mil retort. So that I'm gonna touch on solids a little bit here. Um, a couple of these are pretty obvious and a couple are going to raise some hackles, but I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll make a decent point here. Um, first thing, you need proper screen maintenance and selection. Get your screens as small as you can possibly get them. If that means that you're going to lose a little bit of mud um, when you're running sweeps or something like that, I think that you'll find that it'll pay off if you lose five barrels a day on sweeps, um, but you are gaining a handle on your low gravity solids problem, you'll almost always come out ahead if you can get those low gravity solids. Um, here, this second one is going to be controversial. Pull bits early. Now, I don't mean running extra bit runs, but if you're going to run, if you know you're going to run two bit runs um, and you quite frequently pull one bit that is completely worn out and then the next bit green, I would much rather you pull two green bits than one worn out bit and one green bit. Soon as you start wearing the edges off your cutters on a PDC bit, um, so once this gets to be a one or a two, you are going to start making more and more low gravity solids because you're not making clean cuts, especially in clay form or shale formations. You're not making nice clean scrapes on the rock. So your low gravities are going to shoot up. Okay, this next one, proper pit setup. I've worked with dozens of Derek men. They've all got some sort of special formula they use for how they line up the pits. This is not, this is not a Derek man special. Um, the pits need to be set up to minimize solids transport downstream. And I could teach an entire class on this. I've taken whole week long classes on this. Um, it's an art in itself. Um, there's a lot that can be done, but basically what you wanna do is keep your weirs high and probably not run your gun lines. Um, again, there's lots and lots of situations where you would, um, but that in general, if you can keep your solids close to your shakers and away from your pumps, that's the name of the game. Again, there's a lot that goes into that, but I wanted to touch on it here. Um, you will find, again, you'll have a day Derek man that sets the pits up one way and a night man that sets them up another way. So um, I would, if you're ever out at your rigs and you're looking at these things, just kind of make sure that they're, things are set up to keep your solids up towards your, your shakers. Okay, this one here, and we have the question. I am really glad you asked it. If low gravity solids are a problem, do not use your reuse your Bayrite. I know that for years we use Bayrite recovery. I worked on Bayrite recovery jobs forever. What this does, when your centrifuges are running, they're throwing out Bayrite, they're throwing out low gravity solids along with it. Just the surface area interactions between the low gravity solids and the Bayrite, um, it's impossible to separate these completely. And what you're doing is just putting low gravity solids back in your system. Um, so, so there's a question about using colloidal barite as a weighting agent to increase the low gravity solids. Okay, um, colloidal barite will not increase low gravity solids. Um, barite is a uh, is a high gravity solid, and um, most barite is fairly small in the first place. Um, 
So I don't know if that 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 would actually make it harder to separate things. Um, basically, yeah, I mean, you just can't. Then you have a tiny particle of bayrite and a tiny particle of a low gravity solid, and both of them are going to have to leave in order to separate them out. And we have very little technology right now to get that to to get the low gravity solids out with leaving your bay right in. So I hope that answers both okay. questions. Yes, and here's your five minute warning. So I know you just have a few slides left. So there you go. Good. Um, so I want to touch on this real quick. You need to be running an HTHP. And I'll tell you what, this is the window into the world of emulsion stability. If if you have water in your HTHP, you have poor emulsion health, simply put. Um, this is far superior to ESID indicating emulsion health. So here's one of the things, let me go forward with what I recommend here. Um, I would have your mud engineer bring your HTHP filtrate in and show your company man every day. That does two things. One, it shows that he's running the HTHP, and the other thing is the company man is confirming that the HTHP doesn't have water in it. So if you do have water in your HTHP, the first thing you need to do is get lime in there, get your excess lime concentration up. When you're mixing bayrite, without exception, if you have water in your HTHP, you need to be mixing water wetting agent or solids wetting agents. Otherwise, you could end up with water wet bayrite. Um, best case scenario, that will just fall out in your pits. Worst case scenario, your mud system will flip entirely. Um, and at this point, when you do have water in your HTHP, you got to start running emulsifiers. Make sure you have excess lime and make sure that you are cognizant of the fact that your um, HTHP filtrate will not go back to all oil, nor will your ES go up without shear. Here's an important one. If you do have low ES, but you do not have water in your HTHP, treatment may not be necessary other than adding some lime just to make sure you've got full your your emulsifiers, and more often than not, simply shearing this will solve your low ES problems. So a couple of other things here, and I, I don't know that I'll get to them all. Um, I have one more slide of dirty tricks here, but we've already talked about them. Um, Make sure your mud engineer is running a 50 mil retort and an HTHP. Uh, make sure that he's using it. Um, I would also confirm that he's actually doing a mud check. If anybody, if you can have your company man watch this guy do a mud check, um, I know this sounds paranoid. And I'm very sorry, but I just seen way too many mud checks not getting done. I don't know how many times I've heard it's oil based mud, it takes care of itself, nothing ever changes. What's well, oil based mud? It's expensive. All the more reason you should be doing a mud check. Um, I have actually had companies um, do third-party mud checks. This one here really throws um, a wrench in the works for some mud engineers. Um, some people have had some serious problems when their mud got sent to a third party and it found out that it was nothing like the mud check they were turning in. Another one is, yeah, oil-based mud doesn't change that much, but if you got 24-hour service, you should have two mud checks a day. Okay. Um, going pretty quick here but ensure that your rig crews first in keeping water sources away from the pits this is obvious um, some guy with a water hose can cost you a lot of money always run two barrels pounds per barrel excess lime oh i forgot another thing is people like to empty the cellar um, into the mud pits frequently you can do this you've got a healthy system but really it needs to go to disposal if you want to minimize your costs okay mix your bay right with an oil wetting agent this last one I just want to touch on real quick. Remember I said that that those emulsifiers work as a semi-permeable membrane. If you keep a high water phase salinity, that will ensure that you are not transporting water into your formations. You, will, you It'll keep the driving force of water towards your mud. So there is no, if you're running 200,000 um, water phase salinity, it's very in, in your formation is 240,000, um, which is rare, but it can happen. Um, then the net flow of water is actually going to be towards your formation. So running 250,000 plus water phase salinity sometimes can help you. Um, in in a small part, this adds density. 
and it ensures your clay integrity. And if you need to build viscosity, doing it with water is quite frequently the best way to do it, but you have to be careful. So I'm kind of right up on the time level, but I am willing to take as many questions as we can do. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna make some final comments and then we'll take a couple more questions. I wanna thank everybody for attending today's webinar. You'll receive a link to the recording and an evaluation form, and also a link to register for Dr. Richard's class on drilling fluids that's scheduled for an online virtual class mornings of August 17th through 14th, 17th through 19th, uh, eight to noon. And we had one more question about whether other types of weighting agents such as hematites? Ah, so great question. Um, hematite's obviously pretty expensive to run initially, but if you need, if you need um, weights in excess of 20, 21 pounds per barrel, pounds per gallon, excuse me, um, then hematite's almost necessary. Uh, it, Overall, you have less surface area interaction with your pump parts with hematite because it's more dense. On the other hand, hematite is an angular molecule and it's highly abrasive. So um, quite frequently running hematite can cause even more problems associated with abrasion due to solids. So you may go through pump parts faster with hematite, but in general, if you don't have to run hematite, it's almost always gonna cost you more money just for the waiting agent. Good question. Good, good to know. Well, thank you, Dr. Richards, for your talk today, and we will be sending out the recording. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone, for attending.